portions of tonight's program are in black and white. I'm sorry. In the beginning, the first big hit was, of all things, the society columnist, Elsa Maxwell. I see I your, your holster's beginning to show you. <laughs> What are you doing there? Watch it. You start an avalanche. Watch it there. <laughs> so, so, so charming. So charming and sweet. Our, all this audience, not only you, because of course you're first, but all through the country, they've sent me eight pairs. have been sent to so me what? by... Eight pairs of what? Things to fasten up something. I don't know what, what fastens up. What can it be? What fastens up? I don't know. I mean, it holds the... Uh, I don't know. Wait a minute. Are you, are you wearing eight pairs, or what? No, I'm not wearing any. <laughs> I probably would have to. How much weight did There's you lose? Laurie Chevalier in this house. <laughs> One of my own friends. <laughs> you know, my dear, it's his courtesy that I should sit down after you, but I never know when you're going to drop it, you know? I don't know. <laughs> can be in midair longer than anybody I ever saw. <laughs> Have you ever spoken so frankly before, before the public? Oh, uh, well, I don't think I've ever been asked questions like this before. I have not. Well, you're with Big Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The question then is, is Hoffa an improvement over Dave Beck? Oh, there's no comparison between Mr. Hoffa and Mr. Beck. Uh, Mr. Beck was just a thief. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, this, this is not... We may be in court together, you and I. I hope, I hope the hell you know what you're doing, because I don't know anything. I'm just... I'm leaving the Tonight Show. There must be... A better way of uh, making a living than this. You have been peachy to me always. As I was saying before I was interrupted... <laughs> I believe my last words were that there must be a better way of making a living than this. Well, I have looked... <laughs> And there isn't. <laughs> From NBC in New York, where Jack Parr is alive and well. And now, here's Jack. Thank 
you. Thank you. I wish he hadn't mentioned my name. I wanted to come as a surprise. You know, it's very flattering what you did, but you should never stand up at NBC because when you go to sit down, 200 kids from Saturday Night Live have taken your seats. You gotta <laughs> always be. I, uh, I'm happy to be back here for the night. It's, uh, it's uh, something to look forward to at my age, other than falling down in the bathtub. There's not much <laughs> to look forward to. Oh, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and old friends that are here, and uh, distinguished members of the press and, uh, and uh, the theater that are here tonight, and also to the members of the New York City administration who are out on bail. I think that <laughs> that's... I also want you to know, I didn't mean to give The Tonight Show to Johnny Carson. <laughs> I just wanted to rent it to him. But uh, he's been such a big success, and we're friends, and uh, he, he still remembers. And this time of year, I always get a fruitcake, and it's, it's, it's very, very nice. You know, um, my life is mostly uh, telling you little s stories, anecdotes about my bizarre surroundings and happenings. And uh, the thing is, you don't believe most of them. And I don't blame you, because most of my friends say, I don't think that happened. Well, I wanted to tell you the latest thing that happened. Uh, last year, uh, NBC did the 60th anniversary show on the West Coast, and they called me and said, we wanted you to come. And I said, well, you know, I don't do that kind of thing, and I, I don't want to do it. And they said, well, look, Bob Hope, Johnny Carson, Milton Berle, and you are the national broadcasting company. You simply must be here. Well, they paid my way, and my wife, we went out, evening clothes, black tie, formal clothes. We went to Burbank. Now, Burbank is a... Uh, studio that I had never worked in, you see, and it's a vast place with many, many entrances and enormous parking lots. And so I got out of the car and I didn't know where to go. And I went to a page and I said, I'm Jack Parr. And he said, get in line. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, you, uh, you know, this Burl and Carson and me and he, in line. Well, the line was okay, but I didn't see Burl or Carson or anybody else in that line. It was mostly the typical studio audience from the West Coast, you know, that it looked like, you know, like, like a, a bus station in Calcutta, you know, they were <laughs> t-shirts and, uh, and <laughs> suspenders and a jock strap, you know, just awful. <laughs> And I knew I didn't belong in this group. But anyhow, I kept asking. She says, get in line. And finally, I got, I swear this is true. I'll prove it in a moment. I got into the theater. I swear to you, I was placed in the audience of the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> now, I know that's hard to believe. So, so someone is standing by in Burbank, Pat Sajak, who was involved in this. Oh, there you go. The Bobby Breen thing is back here. Uh, hey, Pat, come in and tell him. Now, this is my dressing room here at NBC, and I was in here that night waiting to tape Wheel of Fortune, and there was a knock at the door. I go to the door. It's, it's Jack Parr and his wife Miriam, and they're wearing lovely evening clothes. And now, you have to know that, that Jack, when I was growing up, was my hero, my, my role model. So this was very exciting for me, and he extended his hand, and I took it, in, and, and we shook for a long time, and he, he finally said, uh, uh, I'm Jack Parr, and, and, and I said, I, I know, and he said, you're apparently the only one in the building who does because I've been standing in your line all evening and, and I have to use the bathroom. So I invited him in, he used the bathroom, he came out, he asked if I could show him where the studio was. It was right across the hall where he was supposed to be. I pointed to it, I assured the pages here he was okay to let him through, and, and that was it. And, and people who know how I feel about him would ask, you know, what was it like to meet Jack Parr for the first time? And I would say, I don't, I don't know. We, we shook hands, uh, we stammered a lot, and I had never stammered before that evening. <laughs> he used my bathroom, he went to the studio, and that's it. Somehow I, I'd always hoped there'd be more. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. The other day, the other day I was in a dark control room editing a lot of the tapes. I have 90 hours of tapes, and I was editing them in a dark control room with two guys, very dark, and uh, they had some, a show of mine on that I thought was kind of funny. And in came a girl with coffee in the darkness to, for the two engineers who were editing it. And I sat there, and she looked up at the screen, and she laughed. And boy, I was pleased, because a young, young 
girl to laugh at me is a big thing to me. <laughs> well, young people, you know. And uh, she, as she left, she tapped me on the shoulder and, and she said, you know, that guy's a lot like Dave Letterman. <laughs> I do have a stammer, and it's, um, I've been, not curse, I'm a very lucky man, but I have two things that are faulty. I have this stutter and stammer, which happens every now and then, and then I have the dimple. And while I am handicapped, they still won't let me park in those places, you know, I still have to. You know. One time, uh, one time, uh, a famous story uh, that happened here was, I don't know, I'm going to explain something to you now. A teleprompter. See, there's no script on this show, and there's no cue cards. There's not room for cue cards. This is a very intimate studio, as you can see. This is what Phil Donahue used to use. He no longer is here. He has teamed up with Oprah Winfrey because there weren't enough rape victims for both of them, you know? So he had to... One time... See, the, the Tonight Show used to be different. It, it was an hour and 45 minutes, 11.15 to 1, every night, and live. So I wouldn't get home till 3. It was a very, very tough show to do when it was live. And uh, what happened was I would, you know, wear sport clothes in, gym shoes and stuff, and then I'd change to these nice clothes that I would have there, and then I would go back and then jump in the car and go home around 2 o'clock in the morning. And one morning, I realized I don't, I don't have any money. I left the money in the other clothes. Now, all I'm talking about is a lousy quarter for the, for the toll booth. But I can, in my paranoid personality, work up myself into a rage. Well, what'll I do? Well, first, I'll give him my wristwatch. No, no, that's... I'll simply say to him, I had lunch yesterday with the Attorney General of the United States, which I had. That's corny. I know the President very well, which I did. Now, that's wrong. Well, who does he think he is to, to, to keep me from trying to get home? No. What I will do is use my deep announcer's voice and very coolly and sophisticatedly tell him. I pull up, roll the window down, and in my voice I said, I don't have anybody! <laughs> and the guy said, we had a good day, be my guest. About my stammer, there used to be a story, apocryphal, I'm sure, at NBC. And, and a lady calls up and she said, um, I don't understand NBC because you have Barbara Walters and she can't say R's and L's and, uh, and, and Tom Broco can't say W's and uh, that Jack Parr stutter, I, I mean, really. And uh, may I speak to the president? And the operator said, yes, here's the president. And the president says, hello. <laughs> I'm only supposed to be charming for 10 minutes. Have I done enough? Uh, as far as we're concerned, you have done, you've done enough. How about a commercial? Uh, that's a very clever idea. Okay. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, Debbie Reynolds, that sweet, innocent-faced, charming young lady, came on the show one night. Now, remember, we had never met we had never spoken to each other until the moment you'll see. What I do remember clearly about that evening was that, I shouldn't laugh, she had been going through a rather well-publicized divorce with Eddie Fisher. And as an amateur gentleman, I naturally wouldn't mention that, but in some silliness, I did. And the rest became front page news for several days. Let me show you this scene 27 years ago from the 60s. You like a well-built Jerry Lewis. He's a very good dancer. Ooh. There you are, very good. Beautiful. I, I never knew she was this beautiful. Mm. I knew you were attractive, but I mean... What a, what, a, what a build, as they say. Yes. <laughs> it's a nose. It's a big call. Do that. Were you this rough on Fisher?
stuffy, formal guest. I think Eddie is out of his mind. I will tell you, she is the funniest lady I know. <laughs> Debbie Reynolds. like uh, Bergman and Boyer after 27 years <laughs> meeting again you are you are a funny lady she has the keenest ear of anyone I ever know there's no well, no one she can't do I just think he's so funny because uh, he, he you know when he called me to uh, uh, you know <laughs> Be a, be a, well, a fr no, the th point is that uh, and, 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 uh, you can, this is the truth. When uh, Jack, uh, you know, called me, he, he said, uh, he, well, <clears throat> when I, when I, when I call her, it's like calling Johnny Winters because I never know whether they're in or not because there's a different voice every time. And I think I've dialed wrong. And the last time it was Betty Davis and she does the greatest Betty Davis I've ever, well, well uh, when he calls it's always first of all no one believes they say it's Jack Power calling so I always say hello how are you Jack how do you feel darling are you quite well <laughs> I wanted to come on here and grab him and you know kiss him and throw him on the floor again but after all these years I'm supposed to be more ladylike so I figured oh you know what the hell I mean, you got a you, class you, up you, at my you, age, you know, Jack. You, you, you have a lovely navel. You, did you know? <laughs> I mean, that's more than I. No, see, I have these dresses designed because they just, I, I just show the one leg now, because you well, know. I think it's enough. I well, mean, I, you, uh, why show both? You everything know, else is shot. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, I can't believe it. You, you, have a, you know, you, you are involved in a strange way in, in my marriage, in that... Now, let, well, wait, let, 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 hear me out now. I, uh, I am not a big believer in pantyhose. I think it's a turn-off. Now, a lot of men agree with me. I mean, I, I, if you're a bank robber, okay, but I mean... Uh, why will... Um, Over your head. My wife goes prancing around in a pantyhose, and I said, why don't you wear a garter belt like Debbie Reynolds? And my wife's... Well, my wife said, and how do you know uh, the Debbie Reynolds? Well, I have a very clear view of, of, of uh, the garter belt, and I thought it was so attractive, and I wish Mary When did would. you get that view? Well, if you watch the monitor, I found this the other day. Okay. Show it, please. <laughs> well, why don't we undress you? My papa. <laughs> Listen, um, uh, yes, ja Jack. What? Do, uh, do, uh, what? do well, Catherine you know, Hepburn. Do Catherine Hepburn. Well, oh well, I well, I really would be happy to do Catherine if you'd like to hear it. I mean, it all. <laughs> I, I love Catherine Hepburn, and so I never like to make fun of a great oh, lady. Because no, I don't ever make fun of her. She, that's, that's the particular sound. All these ladies have these fabulous voices. Betty Davis, Hepburn, oh, Mae West. Oh, I love Mae West because... You know, Mae West, uh, the way she spoke was... Because she never uh, raised her top lip. You know how we smile like, uh, hello. She kept... <laughs> And then she lowered, lowered, she lowered her voice, and she rolled her eyes. Uh, what about Barbara Streisand? Uh, well, sure. Well, I mean, Barbara Streisand has another way of talking, because, you know, I mean, I mean it just depends. You see what I mean? Well, after all, she's a superstar, because, uh, you're a superstar. Can you do, um... I know you, I, yeah, I know a know. famous story you do about Jimmy Stewart. Well, well, because, uh, you know, the... Does the, he stutter? Oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were doing a film together. Do you, do you think he stole it from me? <laughs> well, you're the right age. Uh, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> We were doing a film called How the West Was Won. 
And it was a Listen. Cinerama. You know, the old camera and Cinerama was like, you had to stay in back of this camera because it shot everywhere. And it was cloudy, and we, we, we couldn't get the shot because we couldn't get any sound that day. So we all told stories for two hours. I mean, Carl Malden and Agnes Moorhead and Carol Baker and Duke Wayne and I mean, everyone is sitting, everyone, ex, all the extras were, are in a circle. We're all telling jokes. We're out of jokes. It's two hours later. So he leans over and says, oh, oh, say, oh. Are, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you all out of, of jokes? <laughs> so we said, well, uh, yeah. He said, oh, 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 oh. Uh, He pulls up his chair. He says, oh, oh I have a, a little story for you. Uh, uh, so, so it's a, a story uh, of this man, uh, and, and he's uh, walking his uh, his his uh, uh, d d uh, dog, uh, uh, and uh, another uh, uh, man is um, uh, walking uh, his dog, and he says, uh, "Say, uh, uh, what what kind of a, of a do dog is, is your dog?" Oh well, the other man says, "Oh my." Uh, my dead dog is a Mexican, Mexican spitz. Oh, oh well, 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 I never heard of a Mexican oh, spitz. Oh, yeah, yeah. So just then the, the little dog uh, uh, leans over and, and grabs a guy and he says, Senor. <laughs> I think we should uh, repair to the restroom and, and get ready for the for the next things that you're going to see. Whatever that Let's is. Let's go talk to Dr. Luce when we can move. Yeah. Nice kid. We were in awe of Mike Nichols and Delaine May in the very beginning. They were on The Tonight Show a great deal and on my other shows. They, they were the most talented young people I had ever seen. And how could they come from nowhere and be so gifted? And, and the word comes to mind, I hope it doesn't embarrass them, but genius might work. I'd like you to see them now, and young people, I'd like you to see the kind of humor we had in the 60s. Not all were this brilliant, but as I said, Mike Nichols and Elaine May were a class act. Watch. Information. Uh, operator, will you give me the number, please, of uh, George Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N, at 4411 Huguenot Walloon Drive? That is George Kaplan. Yes, that's right. That is Kaplan. Yes. That is K as in night. A as in Ardvark, P as in pneumonia, L as in luscious, A as in Ardvark once again, N as in New Orleans Chaplin. Uh, I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Just one moment, sir, I will look that number up for you. Thank you very much. Uh, operator, if, if you could uh, try to hurry... Uh, I am looking the number up for you. It's just that I'm, I'm terribly late here, and I'm... I'm that number is listed in your directory. Operator, there is no directory here, I swear to... <laughs> will you please take a pencil and direct yes. the number, Joanne? I promise, I definitely will, yes. The number is... Or the hello, hello, is. hello, hello, operator, hello. Information. Up, 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 operator. Information. Operator, you just collected my dime. Information is a free service, sir. Yes, I... When you hang up your dime, we'll be returned to you. Listen, I, I know it's usually a free service. See, the thing is, in this case, I, I heard the dime, you know, hit all those other dimes. <laughs> I, I know it's in there, and I wouldn't bother you about a dime. The thing is, it's my last dime. I have no change, and my car has just broken down. I'm already over an hour late for an extremely important appointment, so you can see that it's not... Hello? Information. <laughs> Operator, please return my dime. I cannot return your dime to you, sir, until you hang up. When no. you hang up, your dime will be returned to you. No, it won't, operator. Listen to me. I know that sound. I've heard it all my life. <laughs> that dime is in there. Information cannot argue with a closed mind. 
Why don't you try hanging up? Because I can't take the chance. I'll lose the dime. I'll lose you. Look, miss, look, can, can I go over your head? Is there, is there someone else I can speak to? A human being? <laughs> you wish to speak to a human being? Please. Is this about your alleged dime? It's a real dime. <laughs> Hold on just one moment, sir, and I will connect you with the information supervisor. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, listen, operator, hello? Information. Uh, operator, listen, there's, there's no chance that you would say, look, accidentally jostle something with your elbow and like, cut me off completely. We do not work with our elbows, sir. <laughs> Information supervisor. <laughs> Can I help you? Uh, I, I sincerely hope so. Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute ago, operator. Supervisor. What? This is the information supervisor. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that's uh, all right. <laughs> Yes. Just, just a minute ago, one of your girls inadvertently collected my last dime, and as I was explaining yeah. to her, my... Yeah. Car, yes. Bill uh, Terrible doesn't charge a dime. Yes, I know. When I, you no, hang up, no, your dime will no, be returned to I, you. I just went through... Information the, is completely uh, preserved. Not tonight! <laughs> now, Miss, please, try to understand what I'm saying to you. I'm speaking as one human being to another. Forget that you're an operator. I'm a supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor. All right, well, Supervisor, Bell Telephone has stolen my dime. That's what it comes down to. I'm simply going to have to... Well, that's what happened. You stole it. I trusted you. Bell Telephone didn't steal your dime. That's exactly what they did. But Bell Telephone doesn't need your dime. The Bell Telephone Company gets millions of dimes every day. They didn't pick out your dime. Yes, they did. They picked it out and they stole it. And if you don't like the way we do things, why don't you deal with some other company? <laughs> there's, there's, you know there's nowhere I can turn. You've got to do something. I'm not going to argue well, with you. What do you, you mean you're not you going to argue with me? You need to sit there and well, tell me that, that you think I'm the Bell Telephone Company has stolen your dime. exactly what I'm saying. I'd just be very happy to return your dime to you. You will? Yes. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much. Not at all. What is your name and address? <laughs> Miss? Yes? You're, uh, you're going to send me a whole lot of stamps, aren't you? Yes, we are. That's right. I knew it. Look, I've, I've received stamps from you people in the past, and it's a wonderful surprise. <laughs> I need the I need the dime now. Look, can can I go over your head? Is there someone else I can speak to? Yeah, I can connect you with the managing supervisor, Miss Jones. Please. He isn't going to be able to help you either. <laughs> Why don't you give it a whirl? Miss Jones, please. And look, please hurry. Oh, please. Look, hold the line. Yeah. Managing Supervisor, Miss Jones, can I help you? Oh, Miss Jones. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad I finally got a hold of you. What is it, sir? Miss Jones, this is my story. Yes, yes, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> Miss Jones, a, a long time ago... <laughs> One of your operators inadvertently collected my last dime. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, you see, Miss Jones, as, as, as I explained to her, my car is... <laughs> I don't usually do this. Please, you go ahead and cry. 
Bell telephone understands. Thank you. But you. You've lost your dime. No, she took it away. Sir, if Bell telephone has taken your dime, they will be very happy to give you a free call for that dime. Oh, Miss Jones, if, if that's true, I'll never forget you as long as I live. Well, that's true. Oh, sir. thank you, thank you, thank you, no, thank no, you, Miss no, no, no. Jones. It's our pleasure to serve you. Thank you. You just give me the name of the party you're calling and the number. Uh, Miss Jones. Yes, sir. Uh, you're you're dealing here with a broken man. I, uh, she she took the dime before I ever heard the number. Look, forget it. I don't care anymore. Something has snapped. Listen in me. to I, me, sir. If you will give me the name of the party you're calling, you do know that. Yes. That I look the number up for you right here. Bless you. Uh, <laughs> the, the name is uh, George Kaplan, K A P L A N, is a Newell folks? Right. Hold on. Uh, yes, thank you. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, I have that number oh, for thank you. Thank you, yes. That number is order yes. one yes. nine five four. Oh, thank you, Miss Jones. Now tell me what to do. Hold on, please. Hold on, please. Until right. you hear the dial tone. Then yes. dial your number, dial sir. Number. You have a free call. Thank you, Miss Jones. I'll never forget you. is a recording. You have dialed a wrong exchange. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah from KVOA TV4. In the last week that I did The Tonight Show, there was a young man who came on the show. He'd been on many times, always did very, very well. This night, something happened. It was it was the biggest explosion of laughter I had ever heard. The encore went on and on. Now you say, oh, that's that Jack Parr building everybody up again. Well, the point is, I'm going to show it to you, <laughs> and you'll see. I want to leave you with the words of another great man. Ed Sullivan. <laughs> Ed Sullivan, who unfortunately has been stuck in his collar all his life. That's why to this day he walks around like this. stage, I'm going to present 900 Episcopalian rabbis. Now, you know how me and my superlatives, I'll tell you right now, this is the end of the whole darn five years. That's the funniest routine I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Bar none. Hey, I'll sign you right now at your highest price, the highest price you ever got. Um, I am really thrilled and stunned that you should, that you should say this. I've I've worked very desperately hard for so many years to, to reach this point that it, just to be acceptable on television. And uh, to have reached the point where you would say this to me touches me very deeply. I'm, I'm very, very grateful. I really am. But I can't make it. <laughs> can, I, can I please sell something? <laughs> no, that, that probably, Jackie, was the greatest moment. I mean, there were a lot of great moments on this show, but I never saw anything that funny. And you did everything just like I told you to. That's what pleases me so. <laughs> gesture. I'm, I'm really very grateful. It's yeah. very kind of you. Now here's... As a matter of fact... Oh, shut up. <laughs> that was a great moment. Okay. That was, that was a great moment. Now, here's, here's a greater moment. Here is the talk of Broadway, Jackie Mason. <laughs> well, it's a thrill to see me again. I didn't know I was such a big hit, otherwise I wouldn't have come back so cheap. <laughs> I am delighted to find out that uh, I'm a stand-up comedian again here. I'm just looking at myself, I look a little older than I did. <laughs> but I didn't come here to tell jokes, I'm too successful, I don't need this. <laughs> I'm very touched and grateful by Jack Pye, it's, it's amazing how much 
the Gentiles go for Jewish comedians. <laughs> When he, talked to, when he talked about prejudice that I suffered from in this business, I really suffered only from prejudice from Jews who felt I was too Jewish. I never suffered from any prejudice from Gentiles. I only bumped into Jews who kept saying he's too Jewish. Jews are proud to be Jewish as long as you don't sound Jewish. After every show, after every show on Broadway, there's at least one little lady that comes over to me and says, you don't have to talk like that. Why do you talk like that? Can't you talk like me? Talk like a regular person. Mm. <laughs> what happens, all the Jews I know tell me how proud they are of Jewish identity. Jewish identity is so proud, so proud, proud. Then they cut off their names, they cut off their nose, they cut off everything. They, <laughs> they cut off everything. Do I look Jewish? No, thank God for that. I see you have to be thanking God for whatever you are. Maybe, uh, that's why we live in a great country like this. This is the greatest country in the world. Any country that could have Ronald Reagan for president of the United States. I'm not going to make fun of him. I can't stand those type of comedians. I hope you don't get the wrong impression. I hate comedians who make fun of a person just because he don't know what he's doing. <laughs> I think he's one of the greatest presidents that ever lived. That's why honest to pay. It just so happens this is not his field. <laughs> No matter what happens, he never read it, he never saw it, he never heard about it. Uh, every time you see him, he jumps on a horse, he's jelly beans and runs and runs and runs. He's always busy and busy, they keep calling Mr. President. <laughs> they keep calling, where you going? <laughs> he's busy coming and going. He's a great president. It's a, fun, it's a whole new experience in the presidency. We never had a president before who doesn't get involved in politics. It's not his business. <laughs> That's why he keeps laughing all the time. He keeps laughing and laughing. Nobody knows the joke. <laughs> I found out. I found out what he's laughing at. He can't believe he got the job. He's just the opposite of every president we ever had. Every president always looked troubled and miserable. Remember how Carter looked so bougious and nauseous? And remember Johnson terrified to hug him. Remember Nixon nauseous to freeze him. This guy. <laughs> every president we ever had was always going crazy because they could never figure out the solution. This man don't know there's a problem. I like him best. I like him best when he's doing nothing. He's so proud when he's accomplishing nothing that you can't tell that you can't tell that nothing happened. When he came back from Reykjavik from that meeting with Gorbachev, he made an announcement: nothing happened. <laughs> and everybody said, "Thank God, that's it." <laughs> then he jumped on a horse. Where you going? <laughs> See, the guy that should be president is Ted Kennedy. That's the man I like, because he's a brilliant man. Nobody knows how brilliant he is, because when he talks, nothing comes out. He's running for 20 years back and forth. Nobody knows a word he ever said. Nobody ever heard him. All his life, he's saying the same thing. They said, is that true? Oh, I never said that. Oh, I said, should we can't have a country. Why do people say that I said better be better bo but a I never said that? I said ye be but a bum bum be And everybody said, he's right. <laughs> See Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger had the right answer to this whole situation. Do you hear what Henry Kissinger said? The lacket, the cocket, the chee, the pocket, the tete, the pocket lacket. Many people have said to me, you just said. Once you put all, we have to remember, they pocket, they lack it, they pocket, take it, they see it, they pocket up. Why should we take it, they pocket? We could never see this again. Once you put all, I said to the president, I said, Mr. President, you see it. You have to remember the pocket, the pocket like it. We could never see the pocket. Otherwise, it's up to you. 
There's only one great speaker in the world today, Jesse Jackson. Everybody will tell you that Jesse Jackson is the greatest orator of our time. Everybody says it, even though they never heard one word he said. He's the only guy who talks worse than Ted Kennedy. Nobody ever heard a word he said, but they think he's brilliant. They don't know why, but they hear it rhyme. When it rhymes, it rhymes. I don't fly, I don't go, I don't die, I don't go. I'd like to leave you now, but I don't know how to get out of here. Have you, have you met uh, Deborah Needle? Oh, I know. She, said she makes up for me. She marries everybody she sees. Uh, okay. okay, okay, Deborah. Now, you told me that you, you said you thought he was, that you knew him when he was an Irish actor. You said that. I did. I did check him when he used to talk like this. I mean, it's long before your career started. And then I wonder why you're talking like this. Like, everything all of a sudden becomes Jewish. Like, I mean, it's really terrific. I sounds, like your accent. Sounds like Henry Kissinger to me. <laughs> no, Henry talks, I loved you, Henry. Like, <laughs> I have to run this tape forever. <laughs> now, well, you know, when I was married, I was married, naturally, I'm to two Jewish men before, and it took me years to learn how to perfect the her in Jewish. Like, I'm being a shiksa, you know, Nazarene religion and all that. You don't pronounce the, the guttural sounds, so you know, no. you know, and then like it's mishpucha. You know, it cost me 30 million to learn how to do <laughs> why, why, why did you never marry? I didn't marry because I don't need a partner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mary just... All my bit. life, I work alone. What do I need a partner for? <laughs> I took me a lifetime to become a hit. Every time you make enough money, somebody else decides that you make enough for her to move in. There's no system in the world where one person makes all the money and the other one becomes your partner for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> for nothing, I can understand that years ago, there was a reason to get married. Years ago, a Jewish wife or any wife, they used to cook for you, clean for you, work for you. They did everything on the side for you. Today, when a woman says, I do, that's the last thing she does. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, the marital institution in this country is basically a fraud. It's a fraud in most cases. If marriage means the exclusivity of an arrangement where two people are faithful to each other, that's the most essential premise of marriage, the basic ingredient. The basic idea of marriage is the faithfulness between two people through towards each other. Nobody is faithful anymore. It's marriage in name only. Most people are liars and frauds in their marriages. It's a hypocritical institution now. Because 80% of the married men cheat in America. The rest of them cheat in Europe. <laughs> The truth of the matter is Jewish women cheat even more. I don't know if you heard about it. No. Italian women don't cheat, because an Italian woman knows if she gets caught, she'll get killed. A, Jew <laughs> a Jewish wife takes a chance, because if a Jewish husband catches us, he's going to hit her. A Jewish man would never hit. He'd call up his mother. What should I do? <laughs> <laughs> what should I do? Throw her out? How can I throw her out? The guy is still here. What do you want from me? <laughs> I think you know that Jackie was a rabbi. Did you know that? That's right. Why, well, you yeah. think yes, they thought I was a priest? Family. What? <laughs> 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 no, what I, what I meant, the, the philosophical part of you is deeply ingrained in, in your faith and all. Thank you. I'm glad you thought it up. <laughs> I, I, I think the 25 years of hardships that you did have when you didn't work and, and didn't play the big houses or the big theaters or the big anything. But I think that sadness that you had, and I know a little bit about it, I think that's what's made you so damn funny today. I don't I... think you need that to be so funny. <laughs> You'd have rather die the other way. I don't think you have to get wiped out to become hilarious. I think uh, getting wiped out doesn't make you funny, it makes you nauseous. Yeah, it makes you miserable. But, uh, but the truth of the matter is that I never lost my sense of humor, and I didn't think I'd consider myself such a tragic person. I think people are too involved in their own ego trips, and they take themselves too seriously, and their own stardom becomes the only thing they have to live for. You ought to thank God you're living on the site, that you're making a living, you have your strength and your health, and you can look through the window and see what life is about. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh... There is a you, you have some funny stories about, um, about the, 
uh, Gentiles and, and Jews and Italians in cooking, uh, that uh, the Italians are always in the kitchen. Right, uh, making, I say a Jewish and, wife can't find the kitchen. Is it true that the, <laughs> there is a resentment about the, the princess jokes that are going around, the Jewish princes? Is it, would you say there's a resentment about those jokes, but uh, they, it's because they resent the jokes. Their behavior hasn't changed. The jokes they <laughs> 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 Don't the they Jewish women can't cook? Jewish no? women, if they cook, they don't like the cook. They Before don't. they make one meal, they make 12 deals. If I cook today, I don't cook tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> if I cook tomorrow, I'm off Thursday. Friday, I'm at a Chinese restaurant. Saturday, I'm at another Chinese. Every Jewish man that gets married knows he's going to spend the rest of his life going from one Chinese restaurant. <laughs> They make a deal with a Chinaman before the wedding that this will be it. What about Italians? Italians, Italian women. I resent Chinese people anyway. They never eat in Jewish restaurants. <laughs> well, that's the truth. For five thousand years, every Jew is eating in a Chinese restaurant. Do you ever see one Chinese person in a Jewish no, restaurant? I never, I never said a Chinaman saying, "I'm looking for a piece of filter fish." <laughs> What about Italian women? Now, they're good cooks. Italian yeah. women do cook. They're still in the kitchen. Go into any Italian home, I don't care if it's 4 o'clock in the morning, sauces are flying. So. <laughs> Everyone has a sauce in the toilet, in the hallway, in the kitchen. I got the sauce, the sauce. In case he comes home, ha-ha, <laughs> the sauce. <laughs> It's not Gee. nice to categorize people. You can't generalize 100% no. about any denomination. But you, you can't deny that cultural values do pertain. You are, to some extent, a reflection of your history. Mm. If you travel the world, you'll notice people do behave differently in different countries. You can't compare a Japanese wife to an American wife. Obviously, they behave differently. A Jewish husband is comparable to a Japanese wife. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find her. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about that, Miss Needleman? Uh, Miss Needleman. Well, I think you'd make a very good husband. Does anyone here have an, an idea how we can end this damn show? <laughs> I, I could try. I tell you, for I the last the... 20 minutes, I've been trying to think of an ending. <laughs> I, 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 well, I'm to tell you the truth. It didn't have a beginning. Why did you <laughs> I can't tell you how, how much I've enjoyed y you being here t tonight. And uh, we have to bring this thing to an end. And I can't think of anything. And so may we just go among you and wish you a happy holiday. Thank you. Later, Paul Simon hosts and Linda Ronstadt provides the vocals for Saturday Night Live. And on Sunday, don't miss NFL Live with reports, previews, and analysis of week 15 of the NFL season. Then, it's a football doubleheader with live NFL action at its best. Stay with NBC and don't miss a minute. Uh,